Okay, Jeffrey Fox again, introduction to cloud computing and big data slash data engineering. Uh, and this is part I, it's not part one, it's part I. And um, part H was cloud infrastructure part one, this is cloud infrastructure part two. Hope I'm clear. All right, so we're going to go through some specialized hype cycles on compute infrastructure and infrastructure strategies, because they will get us a little deeper into what the um, cloud futures are. Uh, we will look at Gartner on containers compared to virtual machines, and also the, some aspects of AI emerging as the or a dominant force, part of the really important trend. Okay, compute infrastructure, pretty similar. Um, and uh, we have ARM, that's pretty interesting. ARM servers are lower power, and they have some people believe they might replace, or at least uh, give Intel a good run for the money. Um, I assume open power is IBM's technology, open version thereof. Uh, here we have infrastructure as a service, energy management. Um, FPGA accelerators, edge servers, these are all classic computer engineering uh, technologies. Neural networks on, on an ASIC, specialized chip. OS container, we mentioned that before. Micro, con micro operating systems optimized for containers. A better memory, 3D memory, and things like that. Serverless, quantum, neuromorphic, it's edge supercomputing. Specify uh, these industry consortiums in the, for the redfish. Self-organizing automated data centers. And here's how they fit. And notice serverless, our favorite one, is the only transformational one in this area. It beats up neuromorphic hardware and and even of course um, uh, uh, rank for our quantum computing, which I still think is transformational, but it's certainly more than 10 years. FPGA accelerator is just moderate, so sort of interesting. But anyway, I find there's some pretty important trends here. GPU accelerator, well, we sort of know how to do that. Uh, that's certainly going to be pretty solid in two years' time. It's pretty solid already. Um, so we know that. Cloud computing hype is high, but the basic clouds are no longer hype. What's being hyped are things like serverless and function of a service. And it says, it says here, organization are now clear as the practical benefits and risks of cloud computing. Cloud first, it's like companies being AI first, your data center is cloud first. And it's cloud adoption is mainstream. For production and mission critical. All new application development is cloud like. And that's all needed for these digital business, which we discussed with the 2015 um, hype cycle. Okay, here we are. We now, we just went through the computing infrastructure for 2017. Now let's go to 2018, which. Uh, uh, came out, of course, around a few months, six months ago in July. And uh, there were three topics removed from 2017 because they were matured. And they were actually, they were even in effectively the productivity plateau in 2017. Um, these were the energy monitoring, infrastructure as a service, integrated systems, and server management. In 2018, there are four sort of major technologies, transformational, serverless, my, one of my favorites. Um, and that was transformational in 2017, but it's now moved back from five to 10 years in 2017 to two to five in uh, 2018. So it's making progress, as it should. It's obviously a good idea. It's all connected, as I said, with function of a service and having Lots of little microservices sitting there waiting to pounce. You send them a message, do something, and they do it. And you don't have to worry about the computers or everything like that. And um, 
in general for microservices, uh, clouds love it because microservices are like sand. So you have your you have all your servers sitting there humming away, and they they don't have giant blobs of computer of jobs on them, which can take a lot of time, and they use machines rather erratically. You just have the SAM, which are lots of tiny, small instances, which just pop up and down, and you just pour in the sand and level off your load at 80% or whatever is efficient. And it's sort of really good for efficient use of computers and power efficiency and everything like that. Well, we've mentioned neuromorphic computing in the past on these, le in these lectures, and that's of course to try to build hardware that mimics the way uh, deep learning and or human brain works. That's sort of related, but not quite the same idea. For some reason, in memory computing has come back. Uh, more, we, and that's part of the hardware for uh, solid state disks and uh, non-volatile RAM, which are very closely related. They've greatly improved today when we high-pice computers. I always put SSD and MV RAM on my, my clusters. Um, the next, uh, even more important probably, is next generation memory, where we have uh, Hewlett Packard and HPE is Hewlett Packard. Intel and Micron have uh, approached the three dimensional memories, and they have both phase change and what's called spin transfer torque memory. I'm not a great expert there, but it's pretty good, important to be able to have memory which have higher bandwidth. That's the point of 3D. You get you can just feed in the information from all around the memory and get greater bandwidth because you have just more area to feed stuff into the bits in and out of the memory. All right, well, here's the actual uh, compute infrastructure. Um, hype curve is much quieter than the emerging technologies one, and actually changing this rapidly. Um, we have here. Um, here we have something hybrid DIMMs, which are obsolete before they, before they actually landed up in these trough of disillusionment and became obsolete. Well, that's a pretty sad fate for anything. We wouldn't want that to happen to you, would we? Here we have my favorite old stalwart quantum computing still. That's actually got a lot of activity. The federal government has gone bonkers about quantum computing and is really trying to push it in all directions. But lots, whether it works is not so obvious. And how it works and what it does is not so clear. It's not so obvious how you do general purpose computing there. It is sort of clear how you do some AI functions, like annealing on those computers. Serverless infrastructures above quantum computing. Um, okay, we have that. Uh, we have this neuromorphic hardware. So these are the exciting things. They're coming up the innovation trigger. Oh, that's not very well drawn, is it? Um, and up to here, we have something which is good, solid stuff. Containers and managing them. Kubernetes sort of is a one way of managing them and orchestrating multiple containers to work together. Hyperconverged infrastructure. That's um, how we can run very big systems with lots of convergence of all these different technologies. Edge servers, FPGA accelerators. Um, In-memory stacks, software-defined computing, and uh, ARM servers. ARM is sort of giving Intel a solid run for its money. Because ARM, uh, ARM doesn't have some of the legacy, and so they can actually produce effective chips that do what you want, but are more efficient and cheaper and less power and so on. GPUs are now mature. They're the traditional way of accelerating Intel chips over here. GPUs. Okay, pretty exciting. And here we have the same data presented not on that beautiful graph, but they're presented in priority matrix, so the entries are identical to the ones in the past. And um, here we have in memory computing, serverless infrastructure. These are the ones I already went through because they're transformational next generation memory and neuromorphic hardware. Two in the two to five year, two in the five to ten. Enormous amount in the high with GPU which is essentially just about to make it to the productivity plateau. I know. Um, and here we have the deep neural network uh, 
application specific uh, chips, edge servers, hyperconverged containers, so on. All right, so here we have FPGA accelerators, which are not probably correct enough to do that. It's that revolutionary. They're solid work, but not revolutionary. ARM is actually interesting. They recommend them as low impact. I would think ARM could have high impact. Open power is, of course, the IBM architecture. So here you have uh, two proprietary uh, architectures which are different from the Intel architecture. Okay, pretty exciting. And um, sort of interesting how vital this whole field is. Thank you very much. So this says our favorite technologies, Docker and serverless, which is Apache open with software, is dominating innovation. As they say, software is eating the world. Everything is software defined, and software defines everything. <coughs> and this software will implement machine learning and do the automatic analyses of cognitive computing. And you better build that software. The trouble is, we can't build the software fast enough or test it. And we've got to make developers more productive. That's why they like serverless, because it, and they like distributed, because that puts the puts the power back to the developer. Here we have Docker, serverless, changing how enterprise consume servers. They say that CIO should note this and align their use cases. 20% use of Docker, less than 20% becomes 50% by 2020. And by 2020, serverless will be mainstream. <coughs> Currently, serverless is just for specialized small microservices. It obviously, the ideas can run on all possible services. It just requires different implementations. And they point out the difference between virtual machines, which are really aimed at today's existing applications and containers, and microservices, which are aimed at cloud native future applications. And they think that's the way it will go. VMs, which is this declining, will sit on this declining curve of legacy applications, and Docker, etc., will dominate new applications. Um, so containerized, cloud-native, mission-critical applications will be run by essentially about half the, half the companies instead of 5%. Everybody offers container as a service. And so that's all the major ones do, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and that will get extended to everybody. And containers have lots of advantages, bare metal, higher performance. Smaller resource footprint, because you don't have to store the OS. So you can actually get a higher density of use. And uh, you, it's much easier to manage, because they're less, much less complicated. They basically don't change the computing. Whereas poor old OpenStack just changed everything. What used to work perfectly, because Intel did it or Cisco did it, now goes through some miserable OpenStack server, which complicates it. And it says, you know, from 2015 to 17, container adoption has rapidly expanded. That's due to the cloud native applications being developed on them, and the growing use of microservices, and that these containers are very suitable, because you take your services and package them in containers. And as they're small, you can't possibly have an OS with them, that will be ridiculous. Your whole application will be dominated by this, by this OS. So having application only um, containers is very important. It allows you to build things from lots of small components. Because the size of your containers, the size of the component. Not the size of the OS with a 0.01% add-on for the component. Uh, well, here's some, we know all of this, AI, Internet of Things, edge computing, and decentralized organizations are the way of the future. Don't uh, set up your own little company and get employed by the centralized IT organization. Don't work for the centralized organization. 
your AI runs on your system and your AI controls your system. Your clouds of the future will be controlled by AIs which recognize faults, recognize security crises and so on. And everything will increase the automation, software to find everything, and they increase the use of containers. There won't be enough people, that's why you're coming to this class to do this. And you'll have to prepare for serverless. Prepare, have very elastic, adaptive infrastructure strategies, and you better be prepared for lots of streaming data. Because that's what all your Internet of Things will do, it will stream data. And you'll have, you, won't, you need to have the right technologies to do that. And these are all new application types, which most data centers are not prepared. It's known how that you do them, but data centers are set up for batch, legacy, uh, um, repository-oriented applications. That's not the, the key to the future. Um, <clears throat> so it basically says you must use AI to support the enterprise business, or your enterprise will fire you and replace you by somebody else. Uh, we need the machine learning to run the software-defined computer infrastructure. And this AI will look at your system and monitor it and be, take the big data from all, because I mean, it's very easy to produce huge amounts of data on the, how, how our systems run. Um, and then we want to track the environments of these systems all of which we're using across the public cloud and other, and our own uh, premises. Um, we need to have overall, we, the AI's got to adapt our, what we're doing to the goals of the business. If the, the business is try, needs to sell more cereal, that AI better m be motivated to sell more cereal. And there's gonna be periods of change and volatility. And you better have that AI, that's the advantage of AI. It may or may not work, but if it works, it's sort of not temperamental. Uh, at least it's temperamental if you switch the computer off, but it's not temperamental with, the, with respect to emotional things happening outside. And that's the end of this section, part two of the cloud infrastructure, which basically stress the future. There are various very important trends which will Tell you what you need to do to run to do your job correctly if you work in this area. And it tells the chief IT officer what they have to do to keep their enterprise operations at the leading edge. Probably not so many know that. Thank you very much. End of part I of Cloud Computing Introduction. Thank you.